herzlich willkommen. Welcome to the Goethe Institute London and also online via our Goethe YouTube channel at home. My name is Andrea Pfeil. I'm, I am the deputy director here at the Goethe Institute in London and I am especially honored to open our book launch event today. The book Speaking and Being, published in the UK by Profile Books Publishing House, hot off the press in May 2022, has been translated into English by Geshe Ibsen. I would like to give you a warm welcome to Kypra Gümüş Hay and Aicha Türkolu. Um, Kypra is a best... <laughs> I did some practice. <laughs> <laughs> Kupra is a best-selling author, speaker, and founder of award-winning organizations and campaigns. She is currently working as a senior fellow at the University of Cambridge, researching just futures and real utopias, which sounds really exciting. Her book, Sprache und Sein, was first published in 2020 in Germany, where it immediately became a bestseller. In her book, Kupra explores how language shapes our thinking and determines our politics. She shows how people become invisible as individuals when they are always seen as part of a group and the way those in the minority often have to expend energy cleaning up the messes thinking of others. She's, but she also points out how we might shape conversations to allow for greater ambiguity and individuality. How we might all be able to speak freely. Aisha <laughs> is a literally a literary translator from German, Turkish and into English. Last month, her translation of 52 Factory Lane by the German language author Th Selim Öztugan was published in the UK by VNQ Books. The book launch also took place here at the Goethe Institute on April 5th. Today, Aicha will, become the, will begin our discussion with Kubra. She will do um, a short reading and after about 45 minutes, you will get a chance uh, to put your questions to Kupra. At the end of the question and answer session, there will be a chance for you to get a signed copy of Speaking and Being, and there will be refreshments for you outside. At this point, I would like to thank our partners, Profile Books Publishing, and in the back, Kami Films, who are live streaming this event. Before I hand over, I would like to mention that this event is part of our fantastic project called Artificially Correct. It explores how artificial intelligence affects language and text production and on why discriminatory language must be addressed in schools. Please check our website for more information and more talks and workshops on the topic. Now I hand over to both of you and wish all of you an inspiring event. Thank Is this on? Thank yes. you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. Oh, and thank you to everyone online. Um, we're going to launch right into it with a reading from Kupra. So take it away. Kupra. Thank you, Aicha. Uh, thanks for everyone who's come. I'm really excited. And I uh, already saw some pictures of the book traveling in another language and new clothes and um, strangers' bedrooms and uh, houses and traveling along with them. It's always weird and beautiful uh, at the same time to see uh, this little baby uh, multiplying and uh, doing its own thing. So um, I'm going to start by reading a few excerpts from the first chapter and a little bit of the second and then we're going to have a conversation with Aicha. And um, yeah, Andrea 
briefly mentioned Kay Shibs and she's um, um, one of the midwives of this book. I know, yeah, uh, Louisa is probably my editor somewhere, tired of all my birth analogies using for books. But um, yes, uh, she helped bring this book into this language and I'm very grateful for her. And um, now also let's start. <clears throat> what came first, language or perception? On a warm summer's night, many years ago, in the harbour of a small town in southwest Turkey, we were drinking black tea and shelling salted sunflower seeds with languid rapidity. My aunt gazed at the sea, into the deep, calm darkness, and said, look how bright that Yakamos shines. I followed her eyes, but couldn't see a bright light anywhere. Where? I asked. Again, she pointed towards the sea, but I still couldn't figure out what she meant. Laughing, my parents explained the meaning of the word yakamos. It describes the moon's reflection on the water. And now I too saw it shining brightly in the darkness ahead of me, yakamos. I now see it every time I go for a nocturnal stroll by the sea and wonder, do the other people around me see it too? Even those who don't know the word yakamos because language changes our perception. I know the word, so I perceive what it means. If you speak a second language, you can doubtless think of numerous terms that describe phenomena, situations, or emotions for which there is no direct English counterpart. The Japanese word komorebi describes sunlight shimmering through the leaves. Rufa, an Arabic word, is the amount of water you can cup in the palm of your hand. The Greek word meraki describes the ardent passion, love and energy with which someone devotes themselves to a task. And picture this. You are walking through an unfamiliar city and someone gives you directions. You listen carefully, but no sooner have you set off again than you realize you've already forgotten what they've said. Hawaiian has a word for it, akihi. In many languages, such as Indonesian, Turkish, Japanese, Finnish, and Farsi, there are no gender-specific pronouns, no he, she, or it. The cognitive scientist, Lera Borodetsky, describes a conversation she had with someone whose native language was Indonesian. They were talking, in Indonesian, about a friend of Boroditsky's. Her interlocutor, who didn't know her friend, asked Boroditsky all kinds of questions about her friend. But it wasn't until their, until their 21st question that they asked her whether that friend was a man or a woman. Boroditsky was surprised. Was it possible that her interlocutor had spent the entire conversation imagining a person of undetermined gender? And how about you? Would you be able to listen to a story about someone, ask follow-up questions, and even imagine this person without an urge to know their gender? The language of the Tayor in Northern Australia is particularly interesting when it comes to the perception of space and time. Kuk Tayor has no word for left and right. <clears throat> Kuk Tayor, sorry, they use cardinal directions. They say, for example, there's an ant on your left arm, uh, sorry, on your northwestern arm, or can you move to the cup to the south southwest, please? The Tayor can indicate precise, sorry, I, um, South, South, East is one of the worst words in this language, and I put North, East because it's a lot easier to pronounce, so I'll do it next time. Um, but yeah, just a side note. The Tayor can indicate precise cardinal directions even when in completely enclosed spaces by the age of four or five. So when two Tayor meet, their greeting involves asking the other where they are going, even in small talk then, speakers are encouraged to name the cardinal directions, which are an elementary and inherent constituent of the language and perception. Lera Borodiski says that when she tried to learn Kuk Tayor, the following happened. I had 
a school experience, you know. I was trying to stay oriented because people were treating me like I was pretty stupid for not being oriented and that hurt. And so I was trying to keep track of which way is which. And one day I was walking along and I was just staring at the ground and all of a sudden I noticed that there was a new window that had popped up in my mind. And it was like a bird's eye view of the landscape that I was walking through. And I was a little red dot moving across the landscape. And then when I turned, this little window stayed locked on the landscape, but it turned in my mind's eye. And I thought, oh, this makes it so much easier. Now I can stay oriented. When Lera Boreditsky told, Tayor, told a Tayor about the strange experience, strange for her that is, they laughed and said, well, of course, how else would you do it? With its grammatical structures, rules and norms, our language influences not only our perception of space and time, but also our perception of how time moves. How does time pass for you? If I ask you, as an English speaker, to put the pictures of a person in chronological order, starting from childhood to adulthood, you would probably start, arrange them from left to right, starting here with the um, childhood pictures, moving along until the pictures of adulthood. In English, German and all Romance languages, we write and read from left to right, and this is how we perceive time. So speakers of uh, Hebrew and Arabic would do the opposite. They would arrange the pictures from right to left. But how would the Tayor arrange those pictures? Well, they would arrange them from left to right, right to left, from the front to the back, the back to the front, depending on how they were seated, depending on which direction they were facing. Because for the Tayor, time flows from east to west. So if they were facing north, they would arrange the pictures from right to left. If they were facing south, they, were, they would arrange them in the opposite direction. <coughs> Discovering this perception of time and the world has left a lasting impression on me. Only by comparison can we discern the worldview that we've been taught. Everything revolves around us or rather it revolves around the I and the individual perception. I turn and the world turns with me. What if we spoke a language like Hugtayor, which would forever remind us that we are nothing but a tiny dot on a gigantic map, that time flows over us regardless of where the I is? What principles, what humility, would characterize our attitude to other people, to living creatures, to nature. I'm going to jump into the second chapter and read another excerpt, and then looking forward to the discussion with Aicha. Um, one of the language that inspired me while writing this book um, was the language of the Potawatomi. And the reason why this language is has left this huge impression on me is because this language allows you to look at the world through a very specific angle. And Robin Wall Kimmerer is um, a biologist, a scientist, and she's um, a part, a member of this uh, tribe of the Potawatomi. Um, and as an adult, she tried to learn the language of her ancestors. And as she was trying to learn their language, she came across a word. And this word is called um, Puhpuwi. Puhpuwi could roughly be translated as the force with which a mushroom pushes, it pushes itself away from the ground up to the sky overnight. So what is beautiful about this word is not that it is, um, there's a specific word for a specific phenomenon in nature, but rather the perspective from which this phenomenon is being described because this word allows us to look at this phenomenon from the perspective of the earth. So we see how, we observe how this 
mushroom pushes itself away from Earth towards the sky, passing by humans who believe themselves to be at the center of the universe. And this, again, is no surprise because the language of the um, uh, Potawatomi not only uses pronouns like he, she, or it, but many more for, say, insects, plants, trees, even mountains and stones uh, have their pronouns. And that enables people who speak this language to view the world not only through the eyes of the human perspective, but also through the eyes of all the other um, creatures that surround us and that we co-inhabit the world with. So one day she describes how she's um, talking to her students and um, those environmental science students and she asks them, do you love nature? Do you love the earth? And they all start to explain how much they love nature and the earth and how close their relationship is and all of that. And then she asks, and does the earth love you back? And she says there was an uncomfortable situation in the room and um, many felt some form of unease. And she says this uneasiness comes or uh, is due to us humans being used to look at the world through our eyes. And this question implies that we're looked back at. You might have a special relationship to this tree and this tree might look down on you and be like, well, you pissed on me the other day or... Um, you've been very unkind to that friend of mine, the mushroom over there, and we communicate, and we, I know what you did. <laughs> uh, ignore her. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You can laugh at her and with her. Um, so um, this, this language allows us to look at the world through different angles than we're used to, and it... It was so inspiring to me because I then wondered how would a debate, say, on climate change be different if in our language, linguistically, the architecture of a language allowed us and also forced us and enabled us to look at the world through their eyes. Um, how would we talk differently? How would we act differently? How would we consume differently? And now I'm going to jump into a scene one summer when Robin Wall Kimmerer describes what happened when all living speakers of the language of uh, Potawatomi came together. <clears throat> One summer, Kimara writes, all living speakers of Potawatomi came together to teach a language course. They came with canes, walkers, and wheelchairs. Kimara counted them. Nine. Nine fluent speakers in the whole world. Our language, millennia in the making, sits in those nine chairs. The words that praised creation, told the old stories, lulled my ancestors to sleep, rest today in the tongues of nine very mortal men and women. The mother of one man had hidden him when the children were abducted so that he was able to remain behind as a carrier of language. He told the group, we are the end of the road. We are all that is left. If you young people do not learn, the language will die. The missionaries and the US government will have their victory at last. Then Kamara writes, an old woman pushes her walker up close to the microphone and says, it's not just the words that will be lost. The language is the heart of our culture. It holds our thoughts, our way of seeing the world. It is too beautiful for English to explain. Thank you very much for that, Kubra. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you also for that uh, warning and reminder to treat the trees in your life with respect. <laughs> um, <laughs> and also those neglected plants in our houses who will be yeah. like, I'm dying of thirst. <laughs> like, you know, keep your eye on them, seriously. Don't forget to water them. Um, yeah, that was, that was wonderful. I really, really enjoyed it those readings. Um, I love that description of the amount of water you can hold in a palm. That's so, why does English not have that? I mean, I know why English doesn't have it. But um, 
Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I'm going to start with a very boring question, possibly a very vague question, but you can make of it what you will. Um, I wanted to ask, what made you decide to write this book? Like, was it a gradual kind of coming to a realization that it was something you needed to write, or was there kind of a specific moment that prompted it? Like, tell us more. Hmm. Um, so there were many things happening simultaneously and one of those things where you know growing up multilingual what you do is um you associate certain feelings and emotions with certain languages and if there's a hierarchy within the society you live in where not all languages are seen um as you know a source of wonder and a different perspective on the world but maybe are looked down upon what you do is you run between those worlds and try and um, you know, bring some of those emotions to the other side. And to me, it always felt like running around with a bucket of water. And then, you know, you fall and you, you know, stand up again and you stumble. And, you know, in the end, you're happy if a little tiny drop makes it onto the other side. And so there is this hustle on that, that, that happened. And then another thing that happened is that... Um, as someone who was working as a journalist, a writer in the public. And um, I started off really, really young. And uh, Sarah, see in the audience, she knows me from when I was 18, 19, and I uh, came to London to work at her magazine, ML, back then. And so I started off really, really early. And I also started quite naive because I thought um, I was engaged in all these political debates. And I thought the grown ups had some form of understanding what they were doing and and then you grow up and you realize no no one has a plan <laughs> it's a spectacle and 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 because i went into these debates not because i just thought it was fun or joyful but because i saw the consequences of these words growing up as the generation of 9-11 where even when you're 11 12 13 years old on the streets you are being politicized and robbed of your uh, teenagehood and your childhood because all of a sudden you are a political object and have you have to speak on behalf of not only yourself your family but an entire religion an entire group of people continent uh, regions you've never even heard about and when all of these things happen, you see the consequences of words, you see the real life impact, how it destroys people, how it, um, how it um, suffocates people, you, you see how it kills people. And I joined the public political discourse from that angle. And then I saw some people had joined it just because it was fun. To them, it was just abstract words. And it was just, you know, I wonder how this question looks if we if I look at it from that side and pure curiosity without acknowledging the consequences of exploring questions that um, basically were questioning the existence of people dehumanizing people questions that you know many people who've been following the debates in Germany might be familiar with um, like um, shall we save refugees drowning in the Mediterranean or not like how is that a question that is can be objectively discussed. Um, just this very question um, carries so many consequences. And the moment you engage in answering it, you legitimize a question that dehumanizes people. And so I grew extremely frustrated um, with that spectacle because one, they were not facing the consequences and not acknowledging the consequences. And two, I didn't see any constructive, productive development. But so many resources were invested in this, so much attention was invested in these political debates that didn't seem to have any productive outcome for, for society, no new understanding of the world, no, no a new insights, nothing that would bring us together as humans. And instead of contributing yet another smart answer to a dumb question, I wanted to explore why is it that we talk like this? Why is it that we speak in that manner? And and then another um, simultaneous development was that I observed some form of silence that kept that had a continuity. So initially, I wanted to write about silence. I wanted to write about how 
the first German generation of uh, Turkish immigrants in Germany were silent, quote unquote, because they did not speak the language. The second spoke the language, but were not close enough to the microphones to be heard. The third generation spoke the language, did speak closely to the microphones, but was still silent because they were only allowed to speak in specific roles on specific topics. So I wanted to write about the continuity of silence, how we are still not speaking, although people, we, we actively speak, um, how you can um, speak thousands of words and still not say anything. And then I realized how absurd if, for me to write a book on silence if I had the opportunity to speak. So I wanted to write a book that is performative, that um, um, has the audacity to speak, although I'm not being asked, um, to wonder, although people like me are not allowed to be curious, because we are inspected, we are analyzed, we are objectified, we have to speak when we are being asked a certain question, and that question usually uh, has the intention of understanding us, not as an individual, not as a human being, but an entire group of people. So um, I decided to um, dig deep and uh, or rather a uh, swim uh, deeper and deeper and that, that way. it felt like going through water and I wanted to uh, swim as deep as possible until I would hit something that was hard enough to uh, touch, explore and then um, maybe this would be a structure and architecture worthwhile analyzing, looking at uh, to then maybe find answers in as in how as in why we spoke the way we spoke. And to me, that was language. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was the architecture of language. And then, you know, later on in the book, I move on to the architecture of our discourse. And it all boils down to most of our public discourse is not about um, having yet another perspective on something and bringing new facts together to have a great understanding of the world. It is a, it is a battle um, over dominion, over whose eyes do we look at the world through. So it's not about having an understanding, but um, keeping superiority. Sorry, the pollens are in my book. This is the problem with uh, book launches in May. I'll, I'll take this opportunity to ask a question. And you, yeah, you, you, you and the, the pollens are like collaborating. She doesn't stop. <laughs> <laughs> Come, pollens. Um, no. So I, this would be a good opportunity to ask. So you're, in the book, you talk, it, you start by talking about how you, I mean, you speak three languages very fluently and, well, um, <laughs> obviously. Um, and you, in the second chapter, you talk about how you feel that you, the different languages kind of contain different facets of you. And then in the acknowledgements, you say you've kind of come to a point where these different aspects of yourself aren't split between your languages and you've sort of experienced a kind of development over the course of the book. I wondered if you'd talk a bit about that. Yeah, it was a really weird experience because in the book, in, in chapter two, I talk about how certain feelings to me were associated with certain languages and how I was a different person depending on which language I spoke. And obviously that had to do with me having certain experiences and certain contexts in a certain language. So um, I felt Arabic was a melodic language to me because I did, don't understand it, but I hear it all the time uh, when my parents recite Quran or when I'm at the mosque. Uh, Turkish was a very melancholic language to me and also associated with love a lot because this was the language I was loved in uh, first. My, my parents loved me in this language. This is the first language I learned to love someone. And German was the language that told me that I was doing things wrong because this was the language I was introduced to in school. And um, I was being told uh, this is how you write things correctly. It was the language of all those red marks and mistakes. 
but it was also the language that connected me to all those other people around me. It, it also was the language of my intellect um, that I was allowed to flourish uh, in. And then English to me was the language of freedom because I came here and all of a sudden I wasn't asked the same small talk questions I was being asked in Germany. I all of a sudden could just be myself rather than representing Islam. I was so used to it. I was like prepared, like, yes, tell me. And then nobody asked these questions. And I was like, oh, how do you do small talk then? <laughs> but I don't have to be the spokesperson of uh, an entire religion. And... And then I felt very free and also I didn't care uh, about certain things. So I was okay with m making words up if, if they didn't exist yet because, you know, my teacher wasn't in present in that language. Um, so that's how it started. But when I wrote this book, it changed. And then when the book was published, journalists asked me about this. They, they wanted to have those sound bites. And I realized it's not true anymore. And the reason why it wasn't true anymore is it was um, one thing that I wondered while writing the book, but I only found the answer after having written this book. So all of you who read the English uh, uh, version uh, will, will, so I re-edited it because of that. And, and that was a quote by James Baldwin that also is in the German uh, version, but I didn't, it, drew, it didn't really sink in until I wrote the book. So James Baldwin, an Afro-American writer uh, who in the 60s was living in Paris on a self, in a self-imposed exile, he, like many thousands of writers before him and thousands after him, was describing the um, difficulties he was having with the, with, with the language he was working with that somehow did not have the words to describe what he was experiencing, did not carry the weight of what he was seeing and what he was observing, and the alienation he felt with this language. And then he says, I'm paraphrasing, yes, it might be the fault of the language that it doesn't encapsulate my experiences, but it might also be my fault. Because, he says, um, I've never learned to use this language but only learned how to imitate it. And this is a very small but profound difference because we all learn by imitating. And only when we come to a stage where we know that these tools are tools also to be used by us, only when we realize that this architecture of language is not um, unmovable but it's ours, and we can, if we want, tear down a wall, uh, build a window, attach a new building, and, and change it so that it may be able to encapsulate the many people who exist within this language, so that you may be able to speak a language you were never, never meant to speak but be spoken about. And, and only after having written this book, I fully understood what he meant. And that's when it changed. Now I know all languages have the potential to uh, allow me to exist in them. If I take the courage, the effort, if I put in the effort to make room for myself within that language by creating words and filling these words with meaning, by working on the architecture, by basically not being a guest, but one of the m millions of owners of this house. This is something that was really interesting to me, actually, the, the how, uh, how your ideas that you initially developed in the German language book changed as you brought the text into English. Obviously, an excellent translation by Geshe Ibsen. <laughs> Hashtag name the translator. P.S. Pay us more. Um, <laughs> The Society of Authors' Rate is over £100 per thousand words now. Take note. Um, but I wanted to know how involved were you in the translation? And, like, it's the, the book... I mean, I read the book a couple of years ago in German, and it's obviously very German language, Germany, like, German-speaking world-specific. And this book is very much English-speaking world-specific. This is, you know... It kind of encompasses so many of the things that we're talking about at the moment. Um... And like, I wanted to know, what was that like? Like, did you have to write loads more of the book? Like, you have to write a, almost a completely new, well, not completely new book, but 
there's a lot more in in like this version and yes and thank also you the for acknowledging that <laughs> and spotting the differences seriously <laughs> So Geshe and did a beautiful translation, and then where's Lisa? I'm like, ah, oh, there you are. <laughs> and Lisa, my editor, who's hiding behind the lady with the iPad. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, we, we talked about that we want to edit the book so that um, it's not just um, a translation, but also um, to make it. So, so one of the things that was important to me while writing the book was to make it accessible because I feel um, we just talked about this with Andrea. I think I don't know where she is, but about how um, oftentimes people write um, and and produce and create not uh, and and there's this sort of element of um, enjoying not to be understood and. And I and I see where they're coming from, and I can see some joy in it. But I very much enjoy making things accessible. And one when a goal of mine was while writing this book to make a topic that is so polarized, so um, uh, politically ch charged, um, accessible to even people who might not be very interested in in this uh, discussion, in this way of looking at the world, and um, so I wanted it to be a performative book to prove that it is possible to have a reasonable, um, uh, uh, um, peaceful, and productive discussion on a normally provocative subject. And similarly, uh, when translating it into English, I wanted, so it was important to have examples that were familiar to an English-speaking audience. And so we did uh, put a lot of effort in trying to find examples that might be more familiar to people who grew up and socialized here and to make it accessible through experiences that they, they felt closer connected to. Um, so yes, we re-edited it and it was a lot of fun to also, yeah, also reflect on how I had changed mm. while writing the book after writing, having published it and through all the discussions that happened afterwards. Because it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's as relevant to an English speaking audience as it is in Germany, obviously. But um, something I wanted to ask you something, something that really struck me I was reading when I was reading the book, like in chapter seven, I've noted it in chapter seven, um, you made this really interesting point about how if a man walked into a restaurant and started shouting at everyone, the attention that we gave him would kind of serve a corrective function to kind of say, you know, this is an on stop. Whereas in like online discourse, it, it outrage is basically rewarded with attention, which serves to kind of amplify it. Um, and you go on to say, um, why are we happy to play a game whose rules we don't understand? Um, there's a lot of discussion about kind of the shadowy algorithm um, and the kind of digital architecture that shapes the way we relate to each other online. Um, and I wanted to ask you for tips. Um, how do we respond to a forum that kind of invites outrage and also rewards it in that way? So I've invested a lot of time into discussions on how to serve as correctives within that um, within that room on the internet where we are having these absurd discussions where you are being, as you said, rewarded for provocations. And then, unfortunately, we um, uh, uh, mistake attention for relevance. And all of a sudden, people who've bullshitted up their way to prominence and to a lot of attention are somehow relevant and we are we ask them questions that they have no expertise in and they sometimes uh, reject that attention because they want to stick to their expertise but most of the time people just answer because you know the moment you get hold a microphone to someone and ask a question you give that person legitimacy and authority to to speak about this topic and and there are a lot of problems in there from how media works, how journalism works, how journalists work, to the architecture of the internet, or, or rather the architecture of these respective um, social media platforms where you're incentivized to provoke 
where you're incentivized to speak in a certain manner. And yes, there are so many campaigns, so many initiatives that try and respond to this. But unless we talk about the architecture of those rooms um, and then ask those companies to take responsibility, all we're going to do is try and correct a system that is inherently broken. We can't fix it. It's like having this, having, uh, you know, um, two exits in this room. One is very small and narrow, and it will allow you, though, to peacefully leave this room and, and uh, maybe have a really nice, outside experience and there there's a big door that is very easy to walk through but it will rain and uh, people will be shouting and there's a lot of violence on that end for whatever reason and naturally most people will go through that door because it's more accessible it's where everyone is going to go through that narrow small door is a lot more difficult and less people will do it because you're incentivized to go that way and Yes, you can ask everyone at that door to please be kind to one another, to share the umbrella so that, you know, um, as many people as possible don't uh, can stay dry, dry or whatever. You can all have all these corrective measures. But the question is, why is this door so much bigger than this one? So you can ask people to, uh, to say, yes, if we all were nicer on the Internet, things would be better. But why are people unkind, hateful, provocative, and all of that on the internet. It's not because we're born that way, because we're incentivized to behave a certain way. And I'm not trying to rob people of their agency and say we're just products of what surrounds us. It's, it's asking both questions. So yes, it's important to ask people to take agency, but it's also important, maybe even more important on a political level, to talk about what surrounds us. And and it has to do with taking responsibility. It's, it has also to do with understanding that things could be different. This is going to be an awkward segue, but I think it's time for another reading now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, um, shall, I, shall I quickly say what the Museum of Language is? If you like, yes. Yes, yes we have time. No? <laughs> as quickly as you can. All right. I've, uh, Normally it takes half an hour, so um, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it really, really quickly. So well, one of the analogies I use in the book is, so as I said, this book has a life on its own, and we had an argument while writing. So the book wanted to write the Museum of Language, and I wanted to keep my deadline. And um, while we were having this argument, I was invited to a conference, um, a, a law conference, I don't know why I'm not a lawyer. And then on my way there, I met a friend who's also who's a lawyer who was also on his way to this conference. And I talked about this argument. And he said, I need to not only write it down and give in to this book, but I also need to present this um, Museum of Language at this conference. So I went there and for the first time presented as to someone who was not my husband. Where is he? <laughs> um, uh, I presented um, this Museum of Language to uh, uh, other people. And then something really interesting happened. But before telling what that interesting thing was, I'm going to quickly introduce you into the language of um, Museum of Language. So the Museum of Language is an analogy that I um, that this book came uh, up with, and it's uh, an invitation to envision language like a museum, like a room. In this Museum of Language, you will find all the things you know from the outside world. You will find um, different insects, plants, animals. Um, uh, mountains, faraway places, near places. You will find all these different people, colors, um, uh, ideologies and ideas, things of the past, the present, the future, fictional lives, real lives. All of these things are be created in this Museum of Language. And you can uh, spend an, your entire life in this Museum of Language and travel through time and space only within that Museum of Language and explore these things that I have just listed. So in this Museum of Language, there are two types of people. One are the unlabeled. Those are people who fit the norm to the degree that they don't need a label, they don't need to be named, they don't need to be categorized. And these people can walk freely through this museum and explore and do all of the things I just mentioned. Um, and 
And those people never walk against the walls of this Museum of Language, never wonder why certain things are not curated or why certain things are labeled in a certain way or why they are defined in a certain way because the, the Museum of Language is being curated by people just like them, by also unlabeled people. So they spend their entire lives walk, watching the world, exploring the world through someone else's eye without noticing it. The, how privileged the lives of the unnamed, the unlabeled are, becomes even more evident when you look at to, uh, the uh, second type of people in this Museum of Language, the labeled, the named. Those are people who, in one way or another, are, are derived from the norm, the standard of the unlabeled. Um, they are, in one way or another, different um, and not easily to be understood by the unlabeled. But the unlabeled want to understand the labeled. They want to understand them not as individuals, though, but as a category as a whole. So the unlabeled give a label to the uh, um, to those people, and they become the labeled, the named. Um, they give them a name, a definition, a name, a category, and a definition which um, basically consists of all the things the unlabeled find interesting about the named. The category, um, the, the name, uh, builds a glass cage, and the definition uh, defines how wide and how big this cage in this Museum of Language is. So some people live in this Museum of Language in glass cages, some, however, most or all, don't actually fit that definition, so they run against the walls of this glass cage, and the pain that this causes um, forces them to stay away. So some walk at maximum distance to their glass cages, hence degenerating into caricatures of themselves, into stereotypes. Others, however, keep running against those glass cage walls until they uh, start, to, start to create cracks, until their foreheads start bleeding, until for a short moment they might be able to make it outside to briefly have freedom. But then the inspection starts. The unlabeled want to understand this labeled person who doesn't seem to fit their category. So they start... Um, scrutinizing this person, analyzing this person, um, every inch of their body, the way their skin, their hair, the texture of their uh, skin, um, the way they live, love, and exist, and all of these things are being analyzed and uh, under scrutiny, and all these questions are being asked, and this person allows this scrutiny to happen because they believe that at the end of this scrutiny, this, uh, this inspection, there will be freedom. But they're mistaken because at the end of this scrutiny, what happens is they are being introduced into a new glass cage, slightly larger, uh, um, adjusted uh, through the answers they gave th uh, throughout the uh, inspection. So I presented this Museum of Language at this conference, and then the following happened. Um, we had a discussion about... Uh, so one of the, my, my panellists was a law professor um, who talked about the act um, of anti-discrimination in Germany and that the group that predominantly profited of this law were old white men because they were um, asking for... So when they were discriminated against because of their age, they would get, get relatively high compensations. In the audience, that caused some uproar. People were you know, having discussions about this and talking very infuriated about all white men until an old white man raised his arm and expressed his discomfort about the way that they were talking about him, which caused a lot more uh, discussions and a very charged environment. And this is the moment I intervened because I thought, um, because something really interesting had happened. Uh, and I tried to explain what had happened in that room. So this person, this individual, had been um, was used to being seen as an individual, as a human being with a complex past, present and future, with all these flaws and talents and all of these things that made him human. And all of a sudden, he was standing in front of another person, but there was a wall between him and this other person. This person was unable to see him, albeit he was standing right in front of him. This person was unable to um, uh, hear him, although he was speaking, because they only heard what fitted 
um, their questions, what fitted their inspection. All of a sudden, for the first time maybe in his life, he uh, he was robbed away of his complexity and his ambiguity and his multifacetedness and seen as the representative of an entire group of people. All of a sudden, he did not represent himself, but people he's never met in his entire life, complete strangers. All of a sudden, instead of just doing what he normally does, he started, he had to be occupied with the projections onto his category and prove that he doesn't adhere to the negative stereotypes about his group, that he, you know, negative stereotypes about all white men, what are those um, privileged, racist, sexist, etc. So instead of just being who he is, he spends and invests time into explaining who he is not. So for a very brief moment, he... If, if for a very brief moment in a, in, a, in, a, in a space that is limited within that room, he experienced what all the others I've been on the panel with didn't know any different. This was their life. So um, this then led to the discussion sort of being put at ease because we understood what had happened in that room. And um, before answering how to... Uh, a small night. I think we should move on to questions because we're oh, okay, quite okay. well on time now. All right. Uh, well, I'll just read the quote. Okay, yeah. Okay, okay. cool. So it's from the um, chapter of um, individu individuality as a privilege. And I'm uh, going to jump to the end. Um, when will a young woman from an immigrant background, a gay man, a refugee like Binda Guma, a trans woman or a person with a disability be able to just be themselves? When will they be able to say I and me I? When will they be apprehended as an I? Guma writes, I have lost friends and relatives. My flat. So Guma, Vinda Guma is a lawyer um, who took refuge in Germany um, uh, um, because of the war in Syria. And um, she wrote a letter to a German newspaper and some quoting from, from that text. She says, I have lost friends and relatives, my flat, my job, my car, my past, and my homeland in the war. But I only realized later that I had lost my individuality too. I left it behind with a rubber dinghy on the border of Europe. On that note, um, perhaps you'd like a, a just pause for a moment because now we're going to move on to the questions. Uh, does anyone have any? I'm going to keep looking at you all until you feel really uncomfortable. Any question will do. For example, Aicha, where did you get your earrings? I can tell you it was Oxfam on Muswell Hill Broadway, £2.50. And she put them on because they matched the cover of the book. Yeah. <laughs> that pressured me into changing my outfit for today. <laughs> well, I am moderating. I have to have some influence. Any questions? Anyone? There's one over here. Yes. Thank you so much, Kubra. I mean, I have about six questions, but I won't uh, monopolize. Um, power and scripts. You spoke of power, you speak of language, you speak of scripts. How do we come to a place where we can change scripts? Or are we just locked in them forever, like a, a Shakespeare play or something? Yeah, I, I ask myself this question a lot and I can only contribute to the answer. I think it's a collective process. But what I noticed so when I, when I was going back to the Museum of Language, I wondered how can these room just, rooms just be rooms instead of cages? Because we need those rooms, we need those categories to navigate ourselves through the world. We need those, but what makes those, what turns them into cages? What um, turns those keys around and locks people in there? And one of those elements I have seen as one of those forces that turn these keys around, those locks around, is the lack of humility. 
And, and I know it's very difficult to advocate for humility in a culture where you're being incentivized to um, pretend you know, to bullshit yourself, yourself up to the most powerful positions within each country, society, company. In, in in a culture where when women take empowerment courses for business, they are being taught to stand that way and interrupt people in a certain way, put their hands on someone's shoulder to sort of show, show power and basically act with no humility, but um, the lack thereof. And, and in that kind of environment, I know it uh, might seem naive to um, um, advocate for humility, and I also understand why, in response to oppression, humility is not the right response. Um, but when we step away from the question of how to respond, but rather what do we want to build, I would say that humility has to be an integral part of that. Because we are taught to pretend to know who an entire group of people is because we have that information about them. And this is the moment this this um, wall is being drawn in between us and the other, because we 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 believe we know, um, and we stop wondering, we we stop being curious, we stop understanding that most things, ninety nine 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 percent of questions are not answered yet, not explored yet, that the world is still full of wonders and we human beings only have discovered this little bit. We don't understand, I mean, the pandemic has shown that we don't understand what happens within our bodies entirely, uh, within our um, psyche entirely, um, in the, the deep depth of the ocean and the um, far away on, in, in uh, space. Space. Thank, thank you. Um, all of these things are yet to be discovered, but somehow, yet we pretend to know it all, and we are encouraged to behave that way. But if we understood our limitedness, if we truly understood how little we know, and 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 lit humility. And to me, humility doesn't mean to sort of um, sub be subordinate to something else but it means to be emancipated because I know what I know, but I also know that I don't know a lot of other things that are yet to be explored. And many of the injustices of our time are linked to the lack of humility. If, to, to use an example of um, in the Indian, of Indian philosophy, imagine a dark room and there's a big elephant in this room. You invite people in and they're all supposed to um, describe what an elephant is. Some will say elephants are long, soft animals. Others will say they're thin and hairy. And someone else will say they're heavy and leathery. All of these people speak the truth. They um, have all completely conflicting but legitimate perspectives on what there is. If one of these perspectives is being labeled as objective, neutral, or universal, not only are all the other perspectives being oppressed, but we also miss the opportunity to understand what there is. And say the discussion on police violence would be entirely different if it wasn't about um, uh, whether or not people speak the truth about it. I mean, for some people, the police can be an institution that is a source of uh, trust and security. And to others, the very same institution can be a source of violence, death, and racism. And these conflicting truths are true at the same time. And the task of the public then should be to not say who speaks the real truth, but rather um, bring those perspectives into perspective, contextualize them, and then ask questions like, if an institution that is supposed to provide security and safety for all is apparently not able to provide that for all, one, can it do it? Is it, um, is it inherently able to do it? Two, if not, are there alternative ways of creating security in our societies, enabling society, uh, um, uh, safety and trust? And we don't get to answer the question, uh, have these discussions, because we are stuck in, in that point of um, uh, fighting over, again, going to back to that earlier point on whose eyes do we look at the world through? And this 
one set of eyes is the neutral uh, uh, set of eyes, the universal, the objective way of looking at the world. And um, when you look at uh, sexism what, or patriarchal systems, what we see is the universalization of the limited perspective of, um, of, uh, of the male perspective used as the neutral objective, universal perspective to look at the world and hence oppressing other perspectives. Uh, in, in racist structures, we see the universalization of a white perspective onto the world and all other perspectives being oppressed. Uh, in, climate, in the climate crisis, we see the universalization of a human perspective onto the world and hence oppressing the perspectives of all the other living creatures we live with, on, inhabit this planet with. And if, if we understood how limited our perspective is, we would also understand that we are in need of all the other people who have a different perspective onto this world to have a great understanding that we need to stand at the end of our horizon and not to pretend that this is where the world ends, and then be uh, and widen our horizon through the perspectives of others. So I know it's a very long answer, but I think a little more humility would help. And maybe that's just one element of the things we'd need. Um, I think we're main, mostly out of time. Can we get in another question? Do you think another question? And one. Um, first of all, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I was wondering, this is a bit of a personal one, and I hope you don't mind. Um, I was wondering, where in the Museum of Languages would you say you are right now? Uh, because I read Baldwin, <laughs> I hacked the system, and I realized I don't have to ask for legitimacy to become one of the curators of the museum. I can just be it. And yes, yes, it's not enough, um, but investing time and resources into um, changing the way we talk about the world and creating words. Um, so stepping away from analyzing the world that it is to creating the world as we wish it could be. Uh, we, we, um, we changed the Museum of Language and uh, I would say sometimes I'm being pulled into those cages and it's very unbearable when you for once have breathed in a little bit of freedom. Um, so uh, I hate it when, it when, I, when I see that happening, but I also know how to elegantly make myself out of that room uh, and, and to not allow them to lock me in. So... I'm oftentimes pulled into the cages, but I also have a secret key that I can take out and let me through. <laughs> yeah. That was a really good question, by the way. <laughs> where, where, where are you in the Museum of Language? I, I'm fully on show with half Turkish, half English, all the definitions, so people will, like, I'm, I'm still kind of like selling my soul at this point, but I feel like I'm learning from you. <laughs> you'll laugh your way out yeah yeah probably my, i might start going by anglo turkish anyway um can we get in another question or is that too naughty are you how much how much over can we go five more minutes your mission should you choose to accept it okay yes Thank you very much. Just as a question, uh, has there ever been a society where a state, what you're describing, has been ever achieved? Or do you see, you know, at the end, it seems like things are, will, will be intrinsically anyway subjective, right? So, mm. yeah. That's a really good question. And um, so um, humility and the lack of ambiguity only came to my attention as a core element through the book of uh, Thomas Bauer, who wrote about the um, the culture of ambiguity. And so one of his books is also called Vereindeutigung der Welt, which you could roughly translate as. <laughs> I was thinking about how 
all my knees in. Your language was so poor. <laughs> I did it on purpose. Wait, wait, what? Vereindeutigung der Welt. I don't know. I'm off the clock. <laughs> I'm not here in the kitchen. translator capacity. Oh, God, someone else answer. You still hire her. She's amazing. Um, um, Vereindeutigung der Welt, which sort of could be roughly translated into um, sort of... Um, Eindeutig means it was something has one meaning and then, sorry, onceifying the world. Yes, make things up again. Yes, we are the um, uh, curators of the Museum of Language. And if you don't know what onceifying means, oh, there's no. something wrong with you. <laughs> um, so um, it's about um, adhering one meaning to something and it can only mean that. And, um, and he talks about how we live a culture where ambiguity is seen as a threat and where um, uh, conflicting perspectives are seen as a challenge, as in one can only be true rather than understanding that the world is complex, the world is full of ambiguity and we don't understand everything and sometimes conflicting things can be simultaneously true and we have yet to understand how they fit together and he describes how the lack of ambiguity um, came about and um, he says it came he, he talks about the universalization and the and the in, um, intrinsic desire to universalize one's own perspective and how this is linked to colonialism as well and um, so coming back to your question, he talks about how uh, in the south of Spain through, during those golden ages, um, uh, Jewish, Muslim, Christian scholars would collaboratively work together and celebrate and cultivate a culture of ambiguity where they were able to um, embrace each other's perspectives, although they were conflicting with their own perspectives. And, and and not tolerate each other, uh, because tolerate is also, you know, there's some form of tension in that word, but understand that this is a, the, that this is a, a necessary facet of, 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 of being, of, of existing, of coexisting. And um, he gave many examples from the, um, from the Arabic language, and one thing that stuck out uh, to me was, he describes how foreigner as a word um, in our cultures, in our, in our, in our language, in, in German and in, in English, is used as something you name someone, you say this person is a foreigner. And he describes how um, two travelers, uh, one of them being Ibn Battuta, a very famous traveler in, in Islamic history uh, who wrote extensively about his travels. And these two travelers, um, describe very different but very uh, similar experiences of traveling somewhere else and then one of them notices that he is a foreigner there and he starts crying so it's also toxic masculinity uh, uh, like all these men crying about uh, writing about crying because they felt like no one greeted them when they arrived <laughs> <laughs> at, a, at the port, um, so I thought it was beautiful. Um, and then, and then the other example of, again, uh, some someone traveling somewhere. It wasn't far away, but again, he was not being greeted. And then someone comes up to him and says, "I noticed you were not welcome, and you are in state of being foreign. Can I change that?" And it was so beautiful because here, labeling was not. Um, an act of dominion, an act of power, but rather um, an obs you observe someone, you notice something, and you also know this can be overcome. You're not a foreigner forever due to some attributes you can't change, but it is something that happens to you, and it's also something that can be, can be overcome. And it really struck me because I thought, so what if we talked in a way where we observe someone and also know that well, whatever we think this person is might change? And, and it's a really interesting, to me at least, thought experiment. And uh, you, know, you could try it out tonight and view everyone here in this room and, and look at them differently maybe than you used to and see what kind of changes happen in what elements, what, what things um, um, become evident to you or stick out to you and 
and you might start finding people interesting on a different level. So coming back to your question, I don't think that kind of world ever existed as like a state, but there were cultures where ambiguity was celebrated and people were incentivized to live with not knowing and embrace not knowing fully to the last dot. Um, and I think this is also something we could accomplish. I think that's a lovely note to end on, not just because we're out of time, but you know, very <laughs> an optimistic note to the end of the discussion. Um, so I have to do the thanks. Thank you to Kupra. Thank you, Aita, for her wonderful insights. Um, thank you to the Goethe Institute London, um, the Artificially Correct Project. Um, thank you to people who are watching online somewhere, people in the ether. Um, thank you to everyone who's come out and come to see us in person. That's a thing again now. Um, sorry, anyone I've not said thank you to. Uh, uh, now we're going to have, there's going to be drinks outside the auditorium and Kubra's going to do a book signing over there. Please buy the book. Um, I think that's everything. Uh, Thank you so much for coming and being here.